be the same Today is Father's Day and uh, before I preach I thought I will pray for the fathers. We don't celebrate Father's Day, Mother's Day, Children's Day except the Lord's Day but there's no harm praying for uh, on that day. Today is also the yoga day so I don't want to pray for yoga today. Uh, sometimes there is I don't know what to call it humor or paradox or uh, whatever it is a few years back someone when we I when I asked somebody everybody to stand up those who are fathers and would be fathers to stand up a young man did not stand up he was married he didn't have children so he just walked away with eyes you know uh, moist eyes crying actually and I expected that man to be here today because he's a father but unfortunately the devil has his own schemes he's not here for a foolish mistake that someone did and my heart is really saddened by that uh, so between two father's days God has done something great in our church and we all witnessed it last Sunday that God has added one more father to the church whether he is not here or not we are going to rejoice for that right okay um, will all the fathers please stand we don't have any grandfathers yet so um, my status also changed this year and also would-be fathers I mean like to no problem uh, my status also changed I'm not just a father now I'm just I'm a father-in-law now so praise be to God um, Mabel I don't want to embarrass you but would you I didn't ask you uh, before that will you be happy to pray for the men Mm. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Be seated. It's wonderful to be a father. You know, I never realized that privilege. It's a wonderful privilege. It's also to be a wonderful privilege to be a mother as well. And um, it is through the father, fathers we see God as our father and I know some of you have lost your dads and uh, my special prayers my heart goes for you as well but I pray that God will be your father that's a better father than any any biological father okay believe that God might have taken your father away because he want to be your father you know all aspects of it fulfills that great vacuum praise God Amen. I want to continue with the theme of inviting those who do not know God, do not know Christ, into the life of Christ, into the life of the community. Today is the last sermon that I will be preaching from the book of Romans. There has been a unexpected journey that we took on and God has led us so far I would like to explain from the scriptures today the hope that we have in Christ Jesus and then secondly how do we share this hope with those who do not have this hope just two things Christ the hope of the world and how we should share this hope with the world. I have a long passage and a portion of it was read to us. And that was Romans chapter 15 verse 8 to 33 is what I have, I'm going to preach from. But 8 to 13 is already read to us. I would like to, it to be projected again. And I want to read verse 8 and 9 to start with. 
for i tell you that christ became a servant to the uns to the circumcised to show god's truthfulness in order that in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the gentiles might glorify god for his mercy as it is written therefore i will praise you among the gentiles and sing to your name now there's a lot of bible quotations are given a string of quotations are given there verse by verse from different parts of the uh, bible to illustrate to establish this fact that christ became a servant to the circumcised to show god's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that gentiles might glorify for his mercy the whole purpose of jesus christ becoming a servant of humanity coming as a jew and living as a jew was to show or to confirm the patri- the promise given to the patriarchs and it goes on to explain what is the promise given to the patriarchs that is abraham isaac and jacob and others and says the whole purpose of that was that gentiles may glorify god those who are new to christian faith and the biblical writers the writers of the bible looked at the world in a bipartite or way that is two parts one is the people of god the whole humanity was divided into two parts or two groups one is the people of god that is the jews hebrews or israelites as they were called in different periods of time who have received god's will in the form of a written torah or a law and uh, who have sacrifices and priests and a temple and a anointed king they were they considered themselves as the chosen people of god and the rest of them and they were circumcised as a mark of the covenant with god their covenant with god their special status with god the male of this nation this people were circumcised now the rest of the world the rest of the entire humanity they considered they called them gentiles or the uncircumcised they are without god or they do not know the true god now that is how that is why when we use the word gentiles and uh, the people of god or israel or what whatever it is this is how the bible writers looked at it now christ comes to make a big difference and what is the difference he made and before that before we delve into that we need to understand something else what was life like before christ came you know the story the bible begins with the creation of the world and soon very soon immediately in the in the biblical narrative we move on to the garden of eden where god created adam and eve in his own image and then they enjoyed god's fellowship and one day they did something which is very seriously wrong a disobedience an act of disobedience and they lost their fellowship or their relationship with god and they were driven out that is how the story develops now what it all tells us is that man and human beings are lost they are lost and there's an emptiness in human being so that story tells us explains to us or t- t- teaches us that every human being has born with an emptiness in his heart emptiness in his life a sense of lostness in their life now this lostness this emptiness is sort of a is something that gives the moves them into some actions they want to find out human beings all of us have a hunger for something and many of us doesn't know what is that hung, what hung, what is that hunger for all human beings are born with a thirst and but the sad thing is that they don't know what will quench their thirst so religions and ideologies were born God drove them out of the garden grow go draw them out of his presence now man wanted to get back to god 
because he knows whether he dis- whether he had a law or not his consciousness that is what paul has built up in chapter 1 and 2 argued for that very he has a conscious con- conscience he has a mind a more system of moral values he can see the glory of the nature and he say this glorious nature has a creator behind it who is that and this emptiness drives the human beings and so what happened is over the centuries they created ways to reach god from where man is to where god would be as they think the starting point is where man is they thirst and they run for water something to drink and quench the thirst so religions were born ideologies were born all the religions and all the ideologies and the philosophies were an attempt to reach to reach god whom they have lost but the starting point is where we are the human beings my emptiness is a starting point my lostness is the starting point from there i am trying to draw a line a path cutting a trail to reach god who is there i don't know where he is but at the same time god in his mercy did something else from his side he revealed his will to his people on mount horeb and later through the prophets and to the priests he showed his will and he said this is what i require from you this is what you should be doing he revealed his will So there are two points now one is human beings with their intellect with their um, whatever abilities of reasoning they have they have started searching for god and they went in different directions different religions were born all trying to say that we are seeking god we are trying to find god and some claimed they found god and they when they whatever they discovered they claimed to be the true way and the true and that is the secret of religions but there is something called revelation god also took the initiative he revealed his will to moses and to the patriarchs and to the prophets and the priests and we have the bible that is god reaching out now the jews thought this is their exclusive privilege that is where they went wrong no they were chosen they were given god's will so that they will proclaim to the nations that there is hope in god that is not lost you can still find god now christ comes christ comes He dies on the cross. I don't want to repeat all that you know anyway. And he opened a new way. A new way. And that way is the way to God. Okay? Could you imagine that there's one point and there are lines going in all directions. Okay? And what i- what are they trying to do? they are trying to join this line with the reality called god these are lines going towards but none of them have reached but there's a line that originates from god that is god's revelation through the scripture and through his son jesus christ that ultimate revelation and that line is stretching towards this and one line meets somewhere and the line is complete all other lines end in dead ends called the sack they don't get reach anywhere and in that frustration when they are not able to find what they find they must have found something but none of them have satisfied their thirst and hunger none of them have filled that vacuum in their life so religions throw up their hands hopelessness last week i read an article by a very famous guru wonderful profound thoughts and he said something and this is what he said we are seekers and we should remain seekers 
I said, what? What do you mean by that? He said, we Indians are seekers and we should remain seekers. What does he mean by that? He means that we haven't found anything. The father of the nation admitted it. What is it? He was in search of truth. He never found it. He was still searching for the truth. But the word of God says, no, our search has ended. Because any search beginning with human beings have ended futile. Ended nowhere. Didn't find the real God. But God makes a search for humanity through the scriptures and through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the line which meets the seeking. And that is what we call biblical Christianity. So, when this thing happened, when these two lines, the lines from man and line from God meet through Jesus Christ, there is hope. That is the meaning of Romans chapter 15, verses 8 to 9, which we read. One of my colleagues, a good theologian, said something very remarkable, which I really cherish that. And he said, there are various ways to Jesus. There are various ways to Jesus Christ. But there is only one way to God. What is that way? Jesus Christ. People find Jesus Christ. There may be various starting points. Maybe from a Sunday school class. Or maybe a tract that you read. Or somebody who shared. Now you might have come to Jesus Christ. And there are various ways. One of the great hemologists of this nation, this state. Vaman Tilak said, I came to Jesus over the bridge of Bhakti. Because he was a devout Hindu. And was a sort of devout uh, uh, fan or what do you call Follower of Tukaram, who wrote Marathi hymns in praise of Krishna. And he was a man who was devoted. He wrote a lot of uh, hymns about Krishna and other gods and about himself and about Tukaram. And, but writing these hymns, searching for truth, stressing for truth, he started writing about Jesus Christ. And finally, after writing so many hymns about Jesus Christ, he became a Christian. That's an interesting thing. Vaman Na, Narayan Vaman Tilak, N.V. Tilak. He lived in somewhere near Pune, Ahmad, Ahmad, Ahmad Nagar, I think. And he, singing about Jesus Christ, but not knowing Jesus Christ fully, he finally found Jesus Christ. And he said this, I came to Jesus over the bridge of Bhakti movement. My devotion to God. He had, a, he had a tremendous devotion for a God whom he did not know. But he used the bridge of bhakti to come to Christ. And through Christ he found that God. Amazing. Now, you may be wondering where I'm taking you. I'm taking you to the passage back again. What do we see here? Let's read that verse again. Verse 8 and 9 or 15. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that is the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. To say that whatever God had promised Abraham and God has promised to his people, it is true. And he wanted to confirm that. And what is the essence of that? The essence of that is that Gentiles will glorify God. That Gentiles, that people without God, will glorify God for his mercy. And as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Who are the Gentiles? We. 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 All those who are not Jews. Now what happens when Christ came? When Christ came, until then, all the promises the Jews thought are exclusively for them. They thought all the blessings are for them. 
Have you read the Bible? Yes, the Old Testament? You see a lot of promises. A lot of promises. I'll make you a great nation. I will keep you. I will guard you. I will be a friend guard and the rear guard and all these promises. These promises were given to the Jews. Actually, it actually was given to whom? The Jews. But why do you read it and claim those promises? Why do you read it and claim those promises? It belongs to Jews. The Old Testament is a Jewish book. Just like Quran is the book of uh, Muslims and Gita belongs to the Hindus, the Old Testament belongs to the Jews. It is their book. Why are we reading, praying and claiming the Old Testament, which is a Jewish scripture? Because of Christ. Let's return to Galatians 3 verses 13 to 14. Writing to another church of the Gentiles, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hangs on the tree. Now, the effect of that is this. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Because of Christ, because of Christ's death, the promises of Abraham may come to the Gentiles. That is why we are reading. Because the Bible. And we are claiming the promises of the Old Testament. Just for one reason. Because Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between God and human beings. And also between Israel and us. Gentiles. Who had no claim over God's promises. It is now our promises. Praise God. <laughs> that is why we claim, God, if you could bless Sarah, who didn't have children, and Abraham, who didn't have a son, a heir, for his immense property, you can do it for me. Why? That's a Jewish answer, isn't it? Why do we claim that? We claim it because of Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes. That is why we ask God, I am in need. Will you bless me, O Lord? Because you have promised in Deuteronomy that your, your bread basket will be blessed. I want my bread basket to be blessed. But that was a promise given to the Jews, Israelites. Why do you claim that prayer, uh, promise? Why? Because of Christ Jesus. No, in every aspect of the Old Testament, if Christ was not there, Old Testament would have remained a book of the Jews. But we claim it now because of Christ Jesus. When you are in difficulty, when there are problems that we cannot overcome, we pray and ask God as you divided the Red Sea before your people, I want this mountain to go, the sea to divide, this river to dry up. Why do you pray? That is what God did to the Jews for the Israelites. We claim it because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, that is the hope of the Gentiles. Gentiles like us, like me, you and all, we have no partnership, no participation in the covenant that God made with Israel. But now we claim everything that Israel claims. I'm not talking about the nation of Israel. I'm talking about the Old Testament Israel, the people of God, the people of covenant. We claim it because of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful privilege it is. Now, Paul says, look. Now the second passage, second portion is this. Paul says, because Christ has done such a great thing for the whole world, not only for the Jews, not only for God's chosen people, but everybody who is chosen through Christ Jesus, he wants to Preach this gospel. 
preach this share this Christ in Romans chapter 1 when he began writing this epistle he said something which is very remarkable and he said in chapter 1 verse 14 I am under obligation both to the Greeks and the barbarians both to the wise and the foolish it's an amazing statement he said whichever way you want to classify the humanity you want to divide the humanity into Gentiles and Israelites? Fine. You want to divide the humanity into Greeks and the barbarians, the civilized and the uncivilized? Fine. Whether you want to divide the whole humanity into two classes of wise and the foolish? Whichever way you want. Poor or the rich? Men or women? Whichever way, whatever classification you use to classify humanity, I don't care. I am under obligation to all of them. It's so another way of saying, irrespective of gender, irrespective of race, irrespective of space or place where you live, irrespective of your language, irrespective of your nobility or lack of it, I am under obligation. I am a debtor. That is what some other translations would say. I am a debtor to the whole world. Why? Because Christ became a servant to bring hope to the hopeless to quench the thirst of those who are still thirsting for God and he says in a wonderful way he says look at me in the next verse or 16 15 16 to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God I want all of us to see ourselves reflected in this verse. To be a minister of Christ Jesus. To be a servant of Christ Jesus. To serve the Gentiles. In which way? In the priestly service of the gospel of God. This is packed with, this metaphors are packed with meanings. I am first of all a servant of Jesus Christ. And I am called to serve the Gentiles. In which capacity? As a priest. And what am I going to do in that capacity? I will bring the offering of the Gentiles to God. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Let's try to understand that. In the Old Testament, in the Bible, priests were appointed by God. Priests were appointed by God. And the job of the priests were to bring sacrifices to God. Unlike our religion, the religions that we know now. See, um, where I live, in the main road, the main road near Bibewadi, there is a small shrine, a small shrine. And sometimes when I pass by, I see the chicken being offered there. They slit the throat of the chicken they slit, they cut the neck and throw there and I don't know why they do it in public everybody can see that and I, I, I can't stand that uh, sight you know the chicken uh, uh, you know bleeding chicken with a cu head cut because these people have just think that they just bring a chicken and just offer it there right in from the right in Bibiwadi road Bibiwadi Kondwa road uh, on the left side of that, where, where, uh, where our uh, turn to campus begins. But that is not how sacrifices were made in the Old Testament, in the Judaism. You have to bring a sacrifice, an animal. And you bring that animal, and the priest will examine the animal. Like this animal laboratory we have in the um, Salungiwaha road. First of all, before you slaughter an animal, it should be certified by the veterinary doctor. Okay, that's the procedure. It should be followed. But most of the time, it is flouted. That's another truth. So, they have to be certified. Similarly, the priest will in examine the animal and say, okay, this animal is fine. It is perfect. This can be offered. And the animal is taken and they slaughter it and bring the dead corpse, skinned corpse, cleaned corpse of the animal. And the priest accepts it puts it on the altar and depending on the way it should be offered there are different ways of offering it he offers it to God so priest's job is to accept the animal and 
give it to God. Priest is a mediator between. Now what happens here, this verse can be interpreted, this verse can be interpreted two ways. But I would say that what the priest offers here is the Gentiles or the people who have no hope. He stands between God and the people and he says, okay, bring, the, he takes the Gentiles and says, God, I have been to Galatia, I have preached there, may or may not. But definitely, he was in Ephesus. I was spent years in the city of Ephesus. I spent years in the city of Corinth, the center of pagan worship and all sort of immorality. I have told them there is hope in Jesus Christ. They turned away from their idolatry and their immoral ways and they seek God. And Paul says, my job is to travel from, from all over the world, preaching hope in Jesus Christ to a hopeless humanity. He did it in Philippi, he did it in Ephesus, he did it in Thessalonica, he did it in um, Corinth, he did it in all the places. He bringing those who have no hope, turn them into people of hope and give to God and say, yes, this is my priestly offering. Because I bring, as a priest, this to you. Wonderful way of looking at our life, isn't it? We first looked at Christ's life. The life which bridges us with God. Turns a hopeless humanity to a hopeful humanity. A objects of curse, receivers or receptors of blessings of God. Those who are condemned to death is now walking in life, into eternal life. Why? Because of Christ Jesus. Praise God. I belong to that and you belong to that as well. It's all because of Jesus Christ. Now the question is, should it be my exclusive privilege? Or not? Should this be my exclusive privilege? No. Because Paul says, I am in debt. I am a debtor. I have to pay off a huge debt to those who do not have hope. Because I found hope and I have to tell them where to find hope. I found life and I have to tell others where to find life. I have received blessing. I have to tell others where it is. That is my priestly service to God. That is a service that God calls all of us to. To bring hope to a hopeless world. I just want to tell you something more about it. What, how Paul did it. I don't know whether I will ever be able to do that. Or whatever I have done so far comes nowhere near to this man did. He was born in 84, sometime in 84. When he turned 30, he found Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus when he was, tra when he was tra uh, on a journey to persecute and to kill Christians. He was a fanatic. He was something equivalent to the ISIS in those days. He killed so many and he was plotted to kill many. And he was, you know, breathing fire and violence against those who found hope. He was against them. And on that fateful day, maybe an afternoon, on AD 34, around that time, he found Jesus Christ. His life turned. Straight away he went to the desert, the wilderness of Arabia, spent at least three years simply praying, nothing else. Then he comes back to Jerusalem, I think, and then he went out. He took three worldwide journeys. It is not like a journey that I take, you know, I have traveled a lot. It is not, they, they call this, uh, they say, Paul's missionary journeys. It is not really missionary journeys. He will go from one city to another city, stay in that place, sometimes he had stayed in a place for three years. Three years, preach the gospel, establish a community of believers, appoint elders and deacons possibly, 
and move on to another city it was not like you know going from here next week i'll be traveling and i'll go there and i preach in that church and then i move on to the catch the next flight and go to and preach in another church and catch another flight and go. no it was not like that he went stayed with them worked lived with them shared the gospel until he brought some gentiles to be offered to god praise god that was his job how many years did he do that he did it he died around ad 66 so age 34 to 66 22 years right 23 years long 23 years but many of those years he was in jail in caesarea philippi i think he was there for at least for two and a half years i'm not I, i may not be i may be wrong but it is little over than two, two years two and a half or three years just sitting in a jail in rome same thing happened but he had worked now 10 years before his death almost 10 years these dates and are only approximations that for almost 10 years before his death he wrote he complained <laughs> the only parallel i can see in history is the uh, is alexander the great you know alexander the great his um, what was it his greatest sorrow was that he has no more land to conquer right that was why he said that was his only disappointment in life was that i have no more land to conquer i have conquered almost all that land that i know Paul says in 1523 he says but now since i no longer have any room for work in these regions and since i have longed for many years to come to you i will come what he simply says is that that just that phrase is what i would like to highlight since i no longer have any room for work in these regions i want to come to you okay why i should come to you now that is the city of rome but gospel is already preached in the city of rome there is a church in the city of rome but he says i would like to come can we go to 24 next verse i would like to read that 23 24 25 but now since i no longer have any room for work because i have preached all possible places i have no more place to work within 22 years or 23 years a man who is a priest who looks himself or imagines himself as a priest to god to bring gentiles to offer gentiles before god he says i don't know and i don't have any place to work have you ever been like that no now my complaint is that i have a lot of things to do and i don't have time to do now i sometimes ask god if you give me another 50 years i have all these things i can do but now i can't see because but paul says i have done all that i can wherever i there is a possibility wherever there is a road leading to a city i have traveled that road i have searched all the possible places are exhausted and i hope to see you in passing <laughs> that's another interesting thing I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. One place he says is left. That is Spain. And to be helped on my journey there by you. Once I have enjoyed your company for a while. I would like to travel further. There is one small place that I have been preached. Then one small place where Gentiles have been heard the hope in Christ. I want to finish that place also before I die. what a passion for christ have you can we th- imagine that what a passion to share the gospel this is one place spain and the road to spain or the route to spain passes through rome so he said i will come there right i want to take you behind the scenes did he go to spain we don't know but there is some remarks in titus the book of titus that he did go the book of acts 
which describes Paul's journeys ends with this verse that he came to Rome as a prisoner and he was there but he lived as a as he was interned or he was under house arrest so he could rent his own house and he lived in that house and uh, they shared the gospel but his movements were restricted by the Roman government his movements were restricted he had some freedom and then after that probably he was released they said okay no problem there is no no crime again no, no offense against him he is free and he might have traveled after his freedom in Rome to Spain and came back and died sometime in AD 66 under Nero, the emperor, the, the most wicked emperor. So, how did he get there? Have you, how do you know that? How did he get there? No. You read this passage again. I don't have time to explain all this. He went to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem with a gift collected from Corinth and other places. He had a huge gift to be given to the poor people in the Jerusalem church. He went there, but before he went there, a prophet came and told him, you will be arrested in Jerusalem if you continue to Jerusalem. He said, doesn't matter. He went. And as the prophet rightly prophesied, Agabus, I'm summarizing a whole, whole lot of Bible here. As is rightly prophesied, Paul was arrested in the city of Jerusalem, in the temple courts in Jerusalem. He was produced by Jess before Sanhedrin, but he had found favor with the Roman soldier, the commander, and he actually smuggled him to a jail, smuggled him to imprisonment, listen to that, in Caesarea. And he had stood trial in Caesarea, maybe two and a half, three years of imprisonment, during that period, he was tried by many rulers, many, many authorities. And he shared the gospel with them. And to such an extent, King Agrippa was shivering. He said, are you trying to convince me to become a Christian? Because he was so convinced. Finally, the order was this. No guilty. They said unanimously, the Roman authority said he is not guilty of anything. He can go free. But Paul said, I don't want to go free. Paul said, I don't want to be free. I want to remain as an uh, a prisoner. Why? Why? Because one night, the angel of Jesus appeared to him and told him, just as you witness me in Jerusalem, you will witness me, stand for me in Rome also. He had a vision. Just as you witnessed me in Jerusalem. How did you witness in Jerusalem? He was beaten up, arrested, dragged, imprisoned. In the same manner, you will do it in Rome also. He said, I am going to Rome. He said, I will go to Rome. And he was bundled with other prisoners on a ship which had a wreck in the Mediterranean Sea. There was a shipwreck. He just narrowly escaped from that shipwreck. And he was bitten by a viper. But God, he did not die. God miraculously healed him. He took that perilous journey. And he went to Rome where he became a prisoner. Then he might have gone to Spain. The only place that is left for him to conquer. The only place where he thought there is a bunch of Gentiles who also need to hear the gospel. What an amazing vision. What an amazing quest. This is not the quest of Alexander the Great who wanted every land to be Hellenized, to speak the language of Greece, Macedonia. This is not the hunger of any Tukulagan. You know, this is not, the, or Genghis Khan, I wanted to say that. That is not the hunger of that. This is not to expand his own territory at all. This is to expand the kingdom of God. 
so that every Gentile in his generation will hear the hope that is in Christ Jesus. Praise God. That is our calling. I brought two pictures before us today. One is Christ who left all his glory to become a servant so that he can link us with God. Fulfill the hunger and thirst of us who doesn't have God in their life. And then the Holy Spirit released many people like Paul, Saint Paul, Peter, James, Timothy, you know, Titus, and quite huge, an army of people to go and to tell that there is hope in Jesus Christ. That is the business we are doing. That is our business. And let me conclude saying this. We are not preaching a religion. We are not preaching a creed. We are not teaching people to practice a ritual. Because all these things are futile, useless and ends in hopelessness. Nothing. I know one thing. I am not saying yoga is good or bad. I think there are a lot of good things about yoga. But the greatest posture, asana, is not none of these yoga asanas. The greatest posture in world's history is the posture that God, Christ took on the cross. It is only through that asana there is hope for, Jesus, hope for the world. You agree? Yes. If there is any asana, any posture, there there is hope for the world, that is the posture that Christ took on the cross. All other may have use. It may heal our bodies, calm our minds, but it will never solve, save our souls. Amen. Praise God. That is the business we are in. To tell the hopeless world there is hope. I would like to just finish off with two verses. So what do we do? The summarizing the whole series of three or four sermons that we did. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. That is chapter 14 verse 1. Not to quarrel our opinions. No, never. We are inviting people. We are preaching hope. We are not preaching a ritual. We are not preaching a religion. We are not teaching a creed. All these are some importance is there, some significance. But we are sharing hope to a hopeless world. And let's welcome everybody. And verse chapter 15, verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And 15 verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Praise God. Now, I was a young man, long time back. In the college, grew up in the UESI, which is the campus ministry. Ministry to the students, university students. I found Jesus through the UESI, which actually built me up, it laid the foundation for my life in various ways. And one song that we used to sing is that, was this, that is, will we stand, I don't remember the song fully now, will I meet my Savior with an empty hand? Will I meet my Savior with nothing in my hand? That's the song that shook my life. It is not only that song, various other things happened in my life where I decided that I should become a priest to bring hope to the world. I don't create hope, but I have found hope which I cannot keep to myself. I have found love which I cannot enjoy myself alone. I have found grace, which I, it's not my exclusive privilege. I left my job, came to serve him, 
and I, in my weakness and all my frailties, I stand in a small way to bring hope. And I want to say that's a wonderful privilege. Wonderful privilege. When I started singing this song, my hands were empty. But I can say now with proud pride, my hands will not be empty when I stand before God if I die today. Because the Lord has given me some Gentiles to be presented to Him before His altar in heaven. I thank God for 32 years of serving Him. And as the songwriter says, the longer I serve Him, the sweeter He grows. That's my testimony. The longer I serve Him, the sweeter I go. That's my burden to the church as well. Especially those young lives sitting in front of me. I want you to ask this question to yourself. What are you going to do with your life? You found hope. You found love. You found grace of God. And you have a sense of direction and purpose in your life. You want to keep it with yourself or would you like to go to the highways and byways of this city and share it with others? That one day when you stand before your creator, you will have someone, something in your hand and say, Lord, I will lay bird for you according to the grace that is given to me. That's a challenge I would like to do. I'll leave with you. Let me be very practical as well. You don't have to come for full-time ministry if that is not your calling. You don't have to join a seminary if that is not your calling. But by simply smiling at a person, establishing a relationship, and if you get a time, just tell him, I love Jesus, do you love? They may ask you why. You will get a chance to explain the gospel the way you know it. You don't have to have a degree to share the gospel. You may be able to just give a Bible to your colleague, a New Testament with Psalms, just to give away to a colleague and say, please read it. You will find hope in it. You don't know how to explain it, which is fine. There is tracks here available. You can mail one if you don't want to have a face-to-face -face meeting with a person. If you are scared of that, mail it to your colleague and say, that way you share the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. But do it, whichever way. But do it now. Would you all stand with me as we conclude in prayer now. And as we sing this great hymn to address to men and women, to the north and to the south, to proclaim his good news and seek God's grace and courage, boldness to share the hope so that we become priests before him.